One of the most basic features of a Christian worldview is the distinction between God the Creator and everything else. This difference touches everything significant in our lives, but the natural gravity of sinful man tends to pull us in one direction, toward collapsing that distinction, minimizing that chasm between God and creation. We want God to be just a bigger version of us, only slightly out of reach, so that periodically, someone suggests that if we pile up just a few more telephone books, we might be able to peer over the dashboard and drive this world straight up to heaven. But God is that being who is wholly other from everything else in all of existence. Let's unpack why that's such good news. Picture two circles, one very large circle above another very small circle with a large space between them. This is one way to illustrate the fact that we are not even in the same circle as God. God is something entirely different from everything else in existence. Of course, as soon as we start to list the differences between God and everything else, our illustration is rendered wholly inadequate. For example, God is infinite. That is, literally, God has no end in any way. God is limitless, which is why a big circle doesn't even begin to illustrate just how different God is from us. God goes on and on in every way, in every direction. He utterly transcends space and time and every other creaturely limit. Everything else in the smaller circle all of creation, is finite and contingent. It all has limits and is dependent in many ways. Inside the small circle of creation is the entire universe, every galaxy, every star, our planet, all the trees, all the animals and people, even all the angels. All of it is dependent on God for its existence by virtue of it being made. God wasn't made and he doesn't need anything. Creation is also bound by particular sizes and shapes and material composition and natures, and therefore has any number of other needs. All of creation is sustained by God through his provision of energy and fuel and food and warmth and certain functions. And God is not like that at all. There is no process in God, no gears, no functions, no parts, no fuel, no composition, no change. God is the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning, James 1.17. He simply is. Theologians call this the simplicity of God. God is all that he is, all the time, in every way, forever. He is the I am, Exodus 3.14. Everything in the creation circle fades over time. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. Psalm 102, verses 25-27. Everything came into existence at some point, or will come into existence at some point. It will develop, change, grow, wear out, and then at another point it will cease to exist. That star will go out. That solar system will collapse. That tree will die and fall and rot. And every human being is born, lives for some time, and then dies. All of creation passes away. Only God remains the same. God is not only infinite in his being, but also in his perfection. He is the fullness of goodness, love, justice, faithfulness, patience, glory, and joy. This is why it is also true that God has no fluctuating passions. He is all of the virtues in complete fullness. He cannot become more loving or more joyful or more just, because that would imply something good exists apart from him. And it would also imply that he lacks something. But God lacks nothing. He doesn't need anything. He is completely self-sufficient, self-sustaining, eternally and forever, without beginning, without end. It should be clear by now, but this chasm between God and creation is a qualitative difference, not a quantitative one. It's not like you could get into a space shuttle and travel a million years and finally get to God. It's also not merely a lack of knowledge. It's not like if you just thought all the right thoughts or said the right words, like some kind of incantation. You could somehow transport yourself to God. The finite simply cannot ever reach out and touch infinity. Some thinkers of so-called deep thoughts have foolishly suggested that there might be some kind of chain of being, emanations from God, maybe lesser gods or celestial beings or highly enlightened men that can form some kind of ladder to heaven. And one time a bunch of deep thinkers built the Tower of Babel. But God still had to come down to see the tiny speck of that building project. At the same time, because God is infinite, he fills everything. 
He is not limited by our finitude, times, seasons, space, distance, or anything. So he does not really need to come down. But the Bible is teaching us that even when man stands on his tiptoes, he's not even close to reaching God. But God is always everywhere. There is nowhere anyone can go to get away from God's presence. Psalm 139, 7-12. In this way, God is both infinitely transcendent, and because that is true, he can at the same time also be infinitely imminent, infinitely near to us. So there are no ascending degrees of divinity. There is only created, finite nature, an infinite chasm, and God's infinitely perfect nature. No creature can ever take even one step out over that chasm. We cannot go to him. But the good news is that the infinite creator God can and does cross that chasm to us. We cannot ascend to him ourselves, but he graciously condescends to us. He comes down and lifts us up. When the infinite God crosses the creator-creature chasm to us, we call that revelation. We cannot find God, but he reveals himself to us. As Francis Schaeffer once said, he is there and he is not silent. God reveals himself to us through his word. He does this in the first instance through speaking creation itself. The heavens declare the glory of God. Every day the whole universe is talking about its maker in every language, Psalm 19. This is called natural revelation. Natural revelation includes the fact that people are made in the image of God. Male and female, we were made to reflect God in our creativity and work and speech and thought and worship and communion with our maker. We were made to have this communion with God, not only through natural revelation, but also special revelation. God speaking words directly to man. Hebrews 1.1 says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. The whole Bible is the authoritative and perfect record of God speaking to man. Now, if you're thinking carefully about all of this, you might be wondering how it could be that the infinite God could possibly speak to Adam or Abraham. What could it possibly mean that the infinite God could speak a sentence, in whatever language, in such a way that any finite creature could actually understand it? Wouldn't an infinite sentence crush any finite man? And actually, that's true. This is why theologians have often said that this is why God must lisp to us. His word to us is absolutely true, but it must be broken into very small pieces for us to understand, just like parents who first teach their children to speak by teaching them to mimic very short sounds. God is the perfect father, and he has spoken to us in the Bible so that it can be both milk for the simple and meat for the wise, 1 Peter 2.2 and Hebrews 5.13-14. In this way, man can think God's thoughts after him, even as a mere creature. Another question you might have is how an unchangeable God can speak in time. Wouldn't that mean that God began to speak and then finished speaking? You might ask the same thing about God acting in history. Wouldn't that imply change in God? The answer is that all of God's revelations in time are only in time for us who are bound by time. Think about the rising and setting sun. In reality, the sun isn't moving. We are the ones moving through space. Add to this the fact that light actually carries in it all the colors of the rainbow, but it takes certain conditions to divide the light, allowing us to see the different colors. All the colors are always there, but we can't always see them. But sometimes the sun comes out while it's raining and we are able to see all the colors streaming down the sky. You may have seen the same thing with a prism before. God's revelation of himself to man is something like that. God does not change. He is always who he is and his word is always the same. Fundamentally, God has only one revelation, one word, and that word is Jesus, our Emmanuel. But as the shape of history unfolds, distinct aspects of his word, his light, become audible or visible to us and truly impact the story. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. John 1, 1 through 3 and verse 14. The early Christians spent several hundred years studying scripture carefully, trying to explain how the infinite creator word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD produced a very carefully worded definition. 
The church fathers insisted that Jesus is fully God and fully man, one person with two completely unique natures. He is the creator God, and he is a created man. Yet the church fathers insisted that this union of natures, what theologians call the hypostatic union, did not mix or confuse those two natures. The creator-creature distinction is in no way annulled by the union. Rather, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the standing testimony of that great creator-creature divide, and at the same time, he is the fullness of God's revelation to us, the only mediator between God and man, the only bridge across the chasm. All of this leads to three final conclusions. The first is the fact that salvation must be entirely accomplished by God. The creator-creature chasm was infinite in the beginning, and therefore it was only ever and entirely a one-way road. But sin has made this even more stark. Sin is literally turning away from God, turning away from his goodness and glory in resolute defiance and rebellion. In fact, Paul says that our natural state is dead in our sins, Ephesians 2.5. We're not even on the other side of the chasm waving a white flag trying to get God's attention. We're on the other side of the chasm six feet under, and we like it down there. Salvation is entirely the work of God not only because God has crossed the chasm in the incarnation of Jesus, but it is also because he had to dig us out of our sin graves and bring us back to life. While we were still enemies, Christ died for us and reconciled us to God, Romans 5.10. Christ came for us and carried us home to the Father. God does it all, from first to last, and there is no other way it could be. Only the infinite creator God could cross the chasm and make finite sinners right with himself. And given the fact that God does not need us, this means it is all out of his sheer grace. Now, if you've been following along closely, everything we have covered also has massive implications for how you think about how God planned our salvation and the salvation of the world. Remember the simplicity of God. God has no parts or process. God is perfect in every way. He does not change. This means that God does not find anything out. He knows all things immediately. So that means that God knew absolutely every detail of the universe from beginning to end, down to the molecular and atomic levels, before he said, let there be light. He knew about Adam's sin. He knew Jesus would come. And he knew everyone he would save by name. Theologians call this foreknowledge and predestination, and it's what the Bible teaches plainly. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Romans 8, 29 and 30. Frequently, people get hung up on this doctrine because they have not really understood the creator-creature distinction. The common objection is that God's sovereign will, predestining everything, must be stealing human freedom, turning the world into a grinding, fatalistic machine, and people into sock puppets. But that is only the case if you think that our circles are merged, if you think that God interacts with his creation as a really big version of us. But as we have seen, God, in very important ways, is nothing like us. How does the infinite interact with the finite? It doesn't really. It holds the finite. It gives life to the finite. It's true that if God were just a very big Zeus whale, and we were minnows in the great ocean of being, then God's absolute sovereignty would simply amount to coercion. But what if God is more like the ocean? In fact, he's more glorious than that. He is more like an author to our story a composer to our symphony, a brilliant artist, and we are a microscopic fleck of paint on his glorious canvas. Finally, all of this has massive practical implications. Even a cursory glance at the creator-creature distinction ought to make you feel very, very small. It ought to make you humble. It also ought to make you fear God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and men who fear God do not fear the machinations of men. The most powerful men and nations and forces of nature are still just tiny specks of dust, like us, in our tiny circle, next to the infinite greatness of our Creator God. This understanding also drives us to obedience. God is good and just. All glory and majesty and joy and pleasure are found in Him and nowhere else. He is the fullness of reality. 
We are shadowy images of his glory, growing more and more into the solid image of Christ. Every temptation to sin is the offer of some empty illusion. That lust, that greed, that power play is a mirage. God is the fullness of wisdom and beauty and power. In his presence is the fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16, 11. What would you have? A momentary delusion or the real thing forever? All of this underlines why God alone is worthy of our worship. He is our King and our Redeemer, the first and the last, and there is nothing and no one beside him. Isaiah 44, 6. And when you consider this God, the maker of all things, and the fact that he is mindful of man, it drives us to worship and praise. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Psalm 8. One, describe the illustration of the two circles. What is the point of that illustration? The illustration is one very large circle and one tiny circle. The point is to underline the fact that there is no overlap between God's being and all of creation. We inhabit entirely different realms. Two, what is wholly inadequate about the two circles illustration? What is wholly inadequate is the fact that God is infinite and has no limits and cannot really be pictured in any sense like a very large circle. 3. What do theologians mean by the simplicity of God? Theologians say that God's simplicity refers to the fact that he has no parts or process. He does not change. He is always who he is in absolute fullness. 4. How has God crossed the creator-creature divide? God has crossed that chasm through revelation, natural revelation in creation, special revelation in the Bible, and all through Jesus Christ, his one and only word made flesh. 5. How can the infinite creator speak in such a way that finite creatures can understand? God created human beings in his image capable of language and reason, but God condescends to us and lisps, speaking in such a way that people can hear and understand and know him. 6. How does sunlight illustrate how God can be said to speak or act in history while remaining constantly the same? Just as the sun is said to rise and set, but it is the earth that is turning, so too God remains fixed. But his word comes to us discreetly over time in history. Likewise, just as light carries within it all the colors of the rainbow, but only particular conditions allow us to see the various colors, so too different historical circumstances reveal God's word and actions to us. 7. What is God's one and only word for all time? God's only eternal word is Jesus Christ. 8. What is the hypostatic union and what did the Council of Chalcedon say about it? The hypostatic union is how theologians describe the fact that Jesus is both fully God and fully man in one person. Chalcedon said that those two natures were united in the one person of Jesus Christ without confusion, without change, and the distinction between those two natures is in no way annulled by the union. 9. What does the creator-creature distinction imply about salvation? The creator-creature distinction implies that salvation is accomplished entirely by God himself. This is true simply by virtue of the infinite chasm that only the creator God can cross to his finite creatures, but it is doubly underlined by the fact that all men are now dead in their sins. Salvation is a work of God from first to last, and therefore, it is entirely a work of his grace. 10. What does the creator-creature distinction teach us with regard to God's planning of salvation? If God exists apart from time, changeless and omniscient, then he knew every detail of all history, including who he would save before he said, let there be light. Therefore, every detail of history, including the salvation of every individual, was foreknown and predestined before all time. 11. How does the creator-creature distinction help us answer common objections to predestination and the sovereignty of God? Common objections to the doctrine of predestination and the sovereignty of God come from imagining that God is just a bigger version of us. Therefore, his will and power seem to coerce history, turning creatures into puppets. But if God's nature is infinitely above and beyond us, then it's nothing like that, and closer to an author in a story, a composer in a symphony, or an artist in a work of art. 12. What is the practical impact of the doctrine of the creator-creature distinction? The practical impact of the doctrine of the creator-creature distinction is deep humility. We are so tiny compared to God. 
It also teaches us to fear God and obey Him gladly. He is the fullness of goodness and joy, and sin is only an illusion. It also teaches us to praise Him and worship Him. He is worthy, and nothing else in all of creation is.